Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on the why and the what of American literature. Really in this mini lecture we're going to try to talk about what's the importance of reading literature and what are some things we want to think about when we're looking specifically at American literature. So Mark Twain has this great quote that I'm, I'm awfully fond of when talking about studying literature and that is DeSoto, the first white man who ever saw the Mississippi River, saw it in 1542, is a remark which, which states a fact without interpreting it. It is something like giving the dimensions of a sunset by astronomical measurements and cataloging the colors by their scientific names. As a result, you get the bald fact of the sunset, but you don't see the sunset. It would have been better to paint a picture of it. And so what Twain is talking about here is we can very easily communicate facts. I can give you a whole list of facts about a story. It was this, it was that. And in fact, I start many of these mini lectures with some facts. But what's really important to get the full essence is you need some means of experiencing the story. As Twain says, with the sunset, you know, you get all of these facts, but it doesn't really give you the full experience of the sunset. What does? Well, painting a picture. What does would be telling the story of the sunset. And so in literature, what we will try to do is, or what we want to do is to understand that literature is trying to give us that experience, is trying to make us feel the fullness of it. It's not just here, the sun was at this point, the sun was, no, it's really trying to capture the experience. And so we want to be aware of this, that literature in many ways is trying to capture the fullness of that experience. You can think of it very similarly of if you read a memoir of somebody, that might give you the full experience as opposed to just reading a Wikipedia entry on that same person. The Wikipedia entry just gives the bald facts, but the memoir reaches deep into the person and gives you a lot more. So why do we study literature, and what does this all have to do with that quote? Well, of course, we study literature for historical value. Anything written that we're going to read in this course was written at a particular time and was influenced by the historical forces of that time. We're going to read about uh, slave narratives. We're going to read about women arguing and trying to, you know, find their own means in the world in which, it, you know, is largely male-dominated. So it tells us the historical value or gives us historical value. It lets us know what's going on. Because writing stories, whether it's film, literature, any, any kind of thing that is produced is a product of the times. It's a reflection of that world cultural value. This is very similar to historical value, but it lets us know who is prized, what is prized in a given culture. If stories are, if what's written is focused uh, focused by a certain population, that is, you see, you know, say males are doing the large amount of writing versus females. Say a certain population within that, say it's white males that are doing a certain amount more publishing than other people. And that tells us about value, about cultural value value, who the culture values. And historically in American culture that has sadly been, um, white males have been, you know, the cultural valuable people. We see other people writing, but those that get published time and again, those that are seen as the, the important voices, whatever that means, um, typically have been white and male. And so that's one thing we can learn by studying literature is where cultural value lies. I think it's also important to note that we love stories. We really do. We are always, always, always consuming stories. And by stories, we can even, you know, we can look at everything from, you know, our favorite TV series, you know, your Breaking Bad, your Sopranos, to commercials. Listen to commercials. Time and again, they are in story format. We're introduced to a character very briefly. That character has a problem. The character comes to a serious problem, you know, that, that problem continues to boil until a solution is found. And that solution is usually, of course, whatever product is being sold. But we see stories and things like that. We see stories in reality TV shows, right? Reality TV shows are completely story-based. They're telling us a story of certain characters. They're shaping how that story develops. They frame the story um, very, in very, very interesting ways. We are constantly looking for stories. In fact, stories will sell us more. 
And what I mean by that is if you are given the bald facts, if somebody comes up to you and says, boy, and this has been done in studies repeatedly, if somebody comes up to you and says, man, there's this village in this country and all these horrible things are happening. Here's, here's all the statistics. Here are all the horrible things. Would you donate $5? You are less likely to donate that $5 than if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, here's this young person who lives in this village where all these things are happening. This young person has been through this, this, and this. Right? When you're given that story about that young person in that village who's suffering, you are more likely to give $5 than just being given the bald facts. So there's something in our psyche, there's something in our brains, we are wired to love stories. It's how we have historically transmitted information. It is a key communication. It, you know, we, when we talk stories, when we share stories, when we tell stories, we're always communicating something more. There's always something behind the story. It's not just, I'm telling you this story just to tell you the story. There's always that, well, what's behind it? What's the moral? What's the theme? What's the purpose? Right? And sometimes that purpose is very simple. I just want to make you laugh. Sometimes that purpose is much more deeper. I want you to understand something deeply profound about this subject. And I think most importantly, when we look at literature, when we look at writing, we can understand it as a map, right? It's a map that one person has written for someone else. And when we look at anything that's written, it's somebody trying to communicate their understanding of the universe. But we can't capture their entire understanding, right? Just like a map. A map is going to give you just the outline. The, the map isn't going to give you every little bit and piece. It's going to give you a general experience, a general idea of what is out there. Very similar with literature is that it gives us a sense of something. It gives us a way to navigate through certain problems. So if an author is writing about a horrible experience, they're not necessarily giving you, the reader, the perfect way to navigate through that experience, but giving you kind of what the outlook is in, to help you be prepared for those things that are connected to that experience. All right, so what do we mean when we say American literature? I just want to play around with this idea, and I want people to be thinking about this as we get into the course, because this is an important thing to consider. Now, you've, co you've signed up for this course. You're taking this call course called American literature. What does that mean exactly? So the first question we ask is, is it American, when, we, when dealing with American literature, does it take place in America? And what constitutes America? Right, so first of all, we throw the term America around a lot, and what we really mean is the United States. Nobody signed up for this course thinking we were going to be reading literature that was written by somebody in Chile, or in Argentina, or even in Canada, right? By America, we ultimately mean the United States. Now, lots of people, myself included, have problems with calling it American literature because it really is the American, you know, it really is literature of the United States. So what does it mean that we lay claim to that? What do we mean when we say American? I think those are things to have in the back of your head. If an author spends most of his or her life in England, but writes some stuff that's published in America or in the United States, or writes some stuff that um, is about the United States, is that American literature? Is the author American? So this is that, that further extension is what makes somebody an American? Do they have to be born here? How many years do they have to live here? Does their work have to be published here? Right? These are questions we want to be thinking about because we're, we're saying there is this thing called American literature and what, are, what defines American literature? And how do we get those definitions? And who gets to say what is and isn't American literature? What themes, ideas, values, experiences, purposes seem to represent American literature? If we're talking about this idea of American literature, are there higher things besides geography that encapsulate the American literature? Are there certain themes that come up time and again that are representative of the American identity? And again, I hope you can hear it in my voice that every time I'm using the word American, I'm using it in quotes. I'm really talking about, you know, United States culture. Um, you know, what what does it represent? How do are there themes that are embedded in this literature that tells us what the US identity is? How has US history influenced the type of stories we tell, characters we create and remember, and material we consider part of the canon? So again, this question we want to think about 
if if history does shape literature then what are those historical events that have shaped literature right so when you look at a story like rip van winkle by washington irving you can talk about the ways in which the american revolution shaped that story or a pivotal part of that story and the characters that we remember you know what characters do we remember we remember characters certainly from poe's from edgar Allan poe's stories even though many of them are nameless we still remember them um, but how has history or what has history done to influence those characters that we do remember your rip van winkle um, your your very your other characters we run into and um, what do how how do we determine the canon what do we determine is the canon and when you hear the word canon we're not talking about the military um, piece of equipment but we're talking about a collection of works that is representative of something so in this case we're talking about an American liter literary canon what works are representative what works should be part of that um, collection what kinds of writings does the American literary canon consist of and what can we deduce from that? So through this course we should be looking at the readings we look at and thinking about what other readings, because we're not going to read all of the American literary canon in this course. It's just impossible. It's so massive. Um, we just we wouldn't be able to do it. But we do look at a lot of stuff and the question is, you know, what's in that American literary canon and what can we deduce from that? Right? If we see various themes, ideas, and values that are embedded in American literature, and we see different authors, different people, different views of what United States or America consists of, what can we take from that? All right. And so finally, as you get into any of the readings, these are just some thoughts and considerations, some things you should be thinking about as you step into any reading. The first is, of course, when and where is the text from, right? Where was it written? When was it written? Uh, you want to be thinking about that and trying to connect other events, other things to that. Who wrote the text? And, you know, who wrote it is both a small and a big question. Who, in the small sense, is what this person's name is? Uh, and, and what do we know about them? Who, in the large context, is, of course, what does this person represent or how does this person uh, fit into the larger culture. Why did he or she write the text? And this is a question we're of course regularly asking because we don't always know, you know, why was this written by this person at this time? Well, why? What did he or she need to communicate to tell us? Uh, what story needed to be told? What is the experience of reading? And what I mean by that is many students, oh, the experience of reading? I'm bored out of my mind. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what is the author trying to to develop in that reading? What ways is he or she trying to get the, the reader to feel or to understand or to believe something? Is the meaning more than the content? This is a given. That's almost always yes. Uh, but the question is what? Right? If the meaning is more than the content, then what is that larger meaning? And you just want to be thinking about what is under you know, under the material. What is the subtext? What is going on underneath this content? What other sources has this this uh, has? What other sources have has influenced this text? And so you're thinking about what other writings might have dr this this author drawn upon, either directly or indirectly, to write this particular text. And the flip side of this is what other text has this source influence? So here you want to be thinking, okay, this source, this text was written two centuries ago. Am I familiar with anything that may have influenced this? Right, so you're thinking about what influences the text and then what the text has influenced since. What phrases, passages, selections seem to stick out or linger? And again, here you want to kind of think about, as you read it, is there anything that just grabs your attention? That's really well said, that seems important, that you can feel the weight behind the words. What seem, uh, what seem to be symbols, recurring themes, and motifs within the work? Again, you're continually trying to unpack what the write, what's written. You're continually trying to see what's behind 
that text. You know, I often joke, you know, you're trying to find the man behind the curtain, and that, of course, is a reference to The Wizard of Oz, where you have this big, powerful Oz uh, up on display. And, of course, what all it really is is this man behind a curtain. So you're continually looking for that man behind the curtain. In what ways is this text valuable? And that value can either be to you, or it can be to the world at large, or it can be to the time and place in which it's written. Uh, if you read something and your answer to this question is, uh, this text is, isn't valuable at all, then you're not doing the right kind of work. It may not be valuable to you, but it was written and it's been maintained, in some cases, for hundreds of years, so it's had to have been valuable or important to different people. And the question is, where and what is that value? Alright, that's it for this mini-lecture. Uh, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.